J. Daniel Sawyer is the author of over 70 novels and short stories, and he's also the co-host of the Everyday Novelist podcast. If there's one thing that stands out about today's guest, it's his love of books. Hello, and welcome to the Fearless Storyteller Podcast. I'm your host, Ethan Freckleton. Have you ever noticed how fear stops us from creating and sharing our best work? Join the Fearless Storyteller as we explore the heart and soul of writing stories, songs, and scripts that sell with the people who write them. Each guest has their own unique hero's journey and insights into the intersections between limiting beliefs and success. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to have a personal life coach? Coaching works best when you're invested in your journey. Even so, you may have wished you had a support team in place to help you through your ruts and to celebrate your successes alongside you. If only you could afford it. That's why I'm offering an incredible deal right now for the supporters of this show. For you. I've used coaching services in the past and I know what it's like to be witnessed to have my brilliance reflected back to me when I can't see past my obstacles or my doubts. I know what it's like to feel heard and valued by someone who's been there right where I am now, and to have permission to be imperfect and to be powerful. In exchange for your support on Patreon, you'll receive monthly one-on-one sessions with yours truly. I'm a certified master life coach, and I've worked with best-selling authors, award-winning filmmakers, and everything in between. Wherever you're at on your unique journey, no matter the milestone, your goals, or experiences, I'm here to help, and now we can help each other. Support the podcast right now by joining the Storyteller Mentorship Club. Get the coaching support you need, and be a part of my journey as a fearless storyteller. It's a win-win for everyone. Visit patreon.com forward slash Ethan Freckleton today. That's E-T-H-A-N-F-R-E-C-K-L-E-T-O-N. You'll also find a link on the podcast page at ethanfreckleton.com. And now, on with today's show. J. Daniel Sawyer, welcome to the Fearless Storyteller podcast. Well, thank you for having me on. Hey, it's my pleasure. Um... I know you're a friend of Gail Carriger's, and I spoke mm-hmm. with Gail a few months ago, and perhaps even you speak to each other on a podcast for writers. I, I, I hear these rumors. Um, yeah, yeah. She's uh, she's done a couple of long stints on my podcast, The Everyday Novelist, this last year, and we had quite a lot of fun. Um, we've been friends for a long, long time, and we have a ongoing uh, putting each other in each other's novels um, competition. <laughs> <laughs> so nice. I show up in guises in a few of her books, and she shows up in guises in a few of mine, and we have a lot of fun with that. Are these always flattering roles that you show up in? Flattering and gently parodying. Nice. Um, Is it kind of like Waldo? Like a little bit. Uh, there was uh, see what in uh, I think it was Blameless, one of hers. She in- reincarnated me as a uh, mad French scientist with an iced tea obsession and a big red beard, which I had a big red beard till it went gray. <laughs> and I have an iced tea obsession that she completely disapproves of, oh. but that was in retaliation for me doing a romantic clef of her in my novel down from 10, where I had her character refusing to accept the Hugo award because the committee had not cleaned up the venue after the Rocky horror showing the night before. <laughs> It sounds like there's some gritty realism to your writing. <laughs> I've been accused of that, yes. Okay, and so for people who may not be familiar with you or Gil, um, what would you like to share about yourself? Um, I have been uh, writing since I was like six years old um, mm. and uh, decided I wanted it to be a career when I read Lord of the Rings when I was eight mm. and discovered that a mentor of mine, well, idol really at the time, was a friend of my parents, was writing a fantasy series. And I thought, well, if he can do it, 
I can do it. <laughs> so <laughs> I started that night doing my first uh, fantasy novel in, in, in a yellow pad at his desk. Um, do you remember I what got, it was going to be called or what it was called? Oh, yeah, it was uh, it was called. Um, oh, gosh, what was it? I can't remember the title of the book, actually. I can just remember the series. The okay, series was oops. called Midron. It was a fantasy world that was uh, a buffer zone between the real world and f- the land of fantasy that's created by human imagination. Mm. So there's a little so, bit of, like, never-ending story spilling. Into yeah, that. kind of a little never-ending story, a little bit of Narnia, um, a little bit of Xanth all mixed together. Mm. Um, hugely derivative as all first novels are it never yeah. saw the light of day i gave up on it when i was about 18 <laughs> cool so it's a xanth mordor stew that you kept right to hand yep that's cool um <laughs> so we know you started writing oh yeah i started there well i um uh i got into i started writing seriously as an adult uh, while i um worked at a courier company as a weekend manager. So I had a 40 hour weekend, which meant periods of great madness. And then a lot of holding down the fort in case an emergency happened with nothing to do. So I started working on my first science fiction series that later saw podcast form Mm. after a serious rewrite. Once I learned my craft as the antithesis progression, which you can still find in full cast audio at my website, jdsawyer.net on the podcast feed. Hmm. Um, done, God, 30 odd, maybe 40 short stories since then. Uh, most of them have seen print, but not all of them. And, uh, I just finished novels, well, books, I should say 32 and 33. I write uh, mostly mystery and science fiction novels, but I also have several books for writers. And I've just in this last year, taken a push into serious nonfiction with a literary study of the Heinlein juvenile form Mm. and a book called Reclaiming Your Mind about um, learning the art of self-education. And Mm. those will both see print later this year. Oh, exciting. Okay. So you maybe like to write. Yeah, yeah, I can't stop myself. I've had to figure out, I've, I've gone through all the things you do when you're an obsessive writer. Like uh, I crippled myself once on a writing binge because I had a bad uh, space bar on the keyboard. Oh. And uh, <laughs> I thought, I, I literally thought I would never write again. A friend of mine who is a massage therapist very graciously came and slept on my couch for a week and just worked my arms over till they could function again. Wow. And then I had to figure out how to do a proper ergonomic keyboard so that would never happen again. Wow. Yeah, I don't I don't mean this in any sort of dirty way, but I do fantasize about having an in-house masseuse. Like, <laughs> it's it, if you can learn the art, people who do massage therapy for a living can never get good massages. So if you learn the art, mm. you can trade. Oh. And it's wonderful. Okay, so this sounds like a hot tip coming from experience. That's right. Now it does take. It, they 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 do also have high standards, so you have to practice on your uh, on your family members and your uh, lovers or whatever you've got available, so that you can get your craft down. Because right. otherwise, <laughs> they know what's a good massage and what's not. So. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and they don't like bad massages. Yes. Okay, so there's some characterization. Have you worked your massage person into a novel? You know, I haven't. That's a good idea. Okay, as long as you do it flattering. So I, I heard you mention a key word that jumped out just in that exchange, uh, craft. Mm, yes. So what does that word mean to you? Um, craft are the, are the practical skills that you have to execute your art. And art is what you do with your craft. Um, so to make an analogy to sculpture, craft is the ability to wield the chisels and the hammers and the grinders and the polishing stones correctly. And art is the visions that you develop and execute in the stone. Mm. And so these are the practical skills you have already have, mm-hmm. right? And so you're, are you suggesting that it's you know okay to be where you're at with the? Oh yeah, you, no, you you can't get good at anything without practice, and you don't. Um, 
Should I just if, wait until I have the, the, the toolbox that No, 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 no. Have? Yeah, no, no, no. If if you'll forgive me a slight because uh, my uh autodidact's book is actually quite related. I'm gonna crib a few things from it here. Absolutely. The um there's basically two kinds of learning. There's actually three, but there's only two that matter to us once we're conscious. There's learning by doing and there's learning by observing. Mm. Um, observing includes what you see, what you're taught, what you read, everything like that. You're basically cannibalizing other people's knowledge, mm. but none of it sticks. None of it becomes useful to you until you put it into practice yourself find out where the gaps are, figure out what works for you, um, develop your mind, develop your ability to use whatever cognitive or practical tools that you're acquiring so that you don't have to keep going to look at the book. Mm. When it, like if you've ever learned to cook, for example, mm-hmm. we all grow up eating. We know what's, what, it, what it means for something to taste good. Okay. First time you go to cook something, you're hopeless. And you eat, or you use a recipe book, or you chop a finger off, or you well, you do that sometimes even when you're quite advanced. <laughs> um, but when you're using a recipe book and copying it verbatim, you know, just doing what the instructions say, mm. you're just piggybacking on someone else's earned skill. When you have done that a few times and you decide to take risks and modify the recipe or put the book away and cook it from memory, that's when you begin to learn the nature of the materials you're working with, how they interact with each other in a way that you can generalize out to cooking other dishes. Mm. Mm. So the trick to developing any set of skills is the interface between learning from others and doing for yourself. Those of us who grow up sitting in classrooms, we get drilled a lot about how to learn from others. And we don't get much opportunity to learn for or to do for ourselves unless we happen to be in a subculture that values working with your hands or journaling or doing other things that force the practice and internalization of the skills and knowledge that you're being taught. Mm. Mm. That all resonates with me as so as truth that as I've observed it. And I guess my curiosity then is how did you come to an understanding of craft? Um, well, I read a lot as a, um, it, I was one of those kids who hid in the library during the summer when it was too hot and just uh, drove the librarians nuts looking for interesting stuff to read. Mm. And um in my case, it's uh, my writing craft is heavily tied to um, auditory stuff. For some writers, it's tied more towards visual things. Um, I don't know if Gail talked about this when she was on here, but she's a very visual writer. Mm. So she writes kind of like Stephen King does, where she's looking through the camera and the visual imagery. If she can see it, she can then convey it in a really palpable way. Mm-hmm. I grew up, though I love film and have made films, I grew up loving radio dramas and just listening to all kinds of radio dramas and audiobooks constantly because my parents imposed limit on TV time, but not on radio time. So I could always have something going on the tape, on the cassette recorder or whatever, Mm. way back before streaming internet. So I used to record classic radio theater late at night and just listen to those old stories, many of which were dramatized from writers who were top in their field, Hemingway, Heinlein, Bradbury, Asimov, uh, uh, Dashiell Hammett, all of those guys, um, and, and, and going back uh, to like um, Guy de Maupassant, um, the golden age of radio dramatized all those short stories in wonderful fashion. And so I really learned my narrative chops through being immersed in audio. And so for me, the door into craft leads through finding the voice of a character, finding the musical rhythm of speech and the uh, sounds of a place. And once I find that, it unlocks the visual for me. Mm -hmm. But um, most of my early craft development was understanding how to maneuver the words around each other so that they painted the right sensual picture in the reader's mind um 
I got really deep into poetry. I still love poetry. I haven't written any in a while. Um, been writing too much narrative, but um, particularly poetry before the mid 20th century is a fantastic place to learn how language and symbolism and emotion all intersect with each other. After the mid 20th century, poetry became increasingly um, politicized is the wrong word because it has nothing to do with like governmental politics or partisan politics or anything like that. But there was an ideological fight in the arts mm -hmm. about, particularly in poetry, about whether um, poetry was an expression of something through the medium of language or whether its job was to destroy and remake language. Huh. And so um, the rise of um, very unbounded forms of poetry that eventually begin to look like what a junior hire would just put together and call a poem because he's got weird line breaks on a page got to be intellectually respectable that there's some stuff in that school that is amazing but you're not going to learn anything that's useful in the narrative arts by studying that poetry first you need to study the older stuff where they're using the way that language operates phonetically and visually to create subtext and double and triple meanings and surprise mm -hmm. Um, really important skill set, I think. Yeah, sounds like you know, it would have some overlap with songwriting. Oh, yes, very much so. And some of the songwriting, the greatest poetry of the latter 20th century has all come through song, uh, songwriting. Um, Leonard Cohen's one of my favorites, but there's, there are too many amazing lyricists to even begin to list. Yeah, yeah, and I, I know some music professionals would cringe at the idea um, that poetry could inform song or a song <laughs> would be poetry. Um, but I, I think putting, trying to ring a fence around particular techniques or, you know, styles is kind of a mm -hmm. futile. Well, everybody futile likes gesture. to defend their turf. Um, yeah. I'm a big believer in, uh, okay. I'm, I'm going to backtrack a little bit. So this makes more sense. The, um, if you've ever read, say, the Levitical Code in the Hebrew Bible, there's this idea that comes up again and again called abomination. Mm -hmm. And yet you read the same text, and, and the idea shows up all through the ancient Near East. But you read the same text, or you read the neighboring um, the mythologies of the neighboring cultures as well, and you notice that what gets called abomination for the regular people is called sacred for the priests or for the gods. Interesting. Um, and that's because the abomination, the notion of abomination is not, it's horrible. It's a blending of categories that shouldn't, that wouldn't naturally blend. Mm. Um, which is why, for example, shellfish are an abomination. Eating shellfish is an abomination because shellfish, they don't act like fish but they kind of act like snails, but they live in the water. So, yeah, you know, it, they don't, there's not a good taxonomic place in the ancient view of the world for them. So they are wholly on their own, but when humans touch them, they're an abomination because the humans are treading in the territory of the gods. Hmm. It's my view that create the essence of creativity is abomination. It's the deliberate transgressing of boundaries and blending of categories and forms and ideas to find out what happens. Sometimes you get something brilliant. Most of the time it's kind of crap, but the whole natural world works that way too. Uh, sex between two individuals gives you a blending of gametes that gives you a whole new individual who's got his own nature and experience and consciousness. Mm. Hmm. Well, <laughs> it sounds like you've thought about this a lot. Perhaps. I don't know. Um, abomination. I feel like now I'm distracted. I'm like, I want to use that. I may write, I may write, I may write narrative humor <laughs> from time to time. I'm oh, like, cool. I'm like, Ooh, sacred abomination. I, I can roll with that. <laughs> so you 
I, I notice, like, just as you're talking and also from your bio and your body of work that um, you're kind of all over the place in terms of, <laughs> like, forms of storytelling, right? Yeah, I have that failing. <laughs> and, you know, there there are perhaps multiple schools of thought, like, about, you know, whether they feed each other or or whether they're distracting from ever getting really good at a single one or like, like maybe the, the bigger question for you is why do you create? Why do I create specifically? Yeah. And how um, does that tie into the different forms you choose? I have a congenital inability to leave things alone. Uh, <laughs> I'm always noodling at something. I've got some research project I'm on, some major question. Um, sometimes it's practical, sometimes it's philosophical that I'm noodling with. And my stories emerge from the stew of what's in my head at the moment. Like, for example, the novel I just finished, uh, the novel, I, well, I actually it's second to the last novel I finished, but it's the one I did during NaNoWriMo that uh, we did the daily podcast of writing through, mm -hmm. is... Um, it's a story about the first Mars mission. Great. There have been a lot of stories about Mars missions before. Mm -hmm. um, but back in 2012, I read this press release from a guy that wanted to do a reality TV show of the first Mars mission. And I thought, now that would be crazy. <laughs> I also happen to be really interested in geopolitics and the um, the way that the entire, all the things, all, all the different threads that are feeding into the current moment of cultural and geopolitical meltdown. Um, the, the reasons run deep and they go back hundreds of years and it's, uh, it's fun stuff, but it occurred to me that I could put those two ideas together and have a glorious disaster in outer space where the folks that got selected for the high drama of a reality TV show going to Mars, that's already pretty dangerous because you want stable people on important space missions because everybody's life depends on being able to get along. You can't mm. afford a mutiny in space. Sounds like a boring TV show. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and the, uh, the way reality TV works, of course, is that they deliberately select the kinds of personality types that will be most, uh, most dramatic in conflict with each other. And then they prod and push the participants until they get into fights. And then they can have dramatic makeup scenes and whatnot. It's, you know, it, it's not reality TV so much as it is a kind of improvisational theater. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but it occurred to me that the amount of money that would take for this kind of thing, a smart producer, and I put the word, uh, I put the uh, word smart in air quotes, mm -hmm. would seek whatever financing he could to make his life easier. For example, soliciting funds from national security apparatus that might, for example, have an interest in getting people who were holding archives that were serving as dead drops for Julie, for Julian Assange off planet so they could kill him. Um, the way that the way that high profile leakers um, ensure their life is that they keep the worst secrets mm -hmm. in, in secret hands and encrypted archives. And it, they've got an automatic process where if they are killed or if they die under mysterious circumstances, these people all get the encryption keys and the secrets all drop. So what I wound up with was a ship full of people who, unbeknownst to each other, weren't just there for high drama and had been selected because they're disagreeable and irascible and can't possibly get along. But they've also been put there so that um, parties back home would have the option of taking out a very high profile, uncomfortable leaker that was causing problems for political and business establishments. Mm. And suddenly you put those ideas all together. You've got high drama on the ship. You've got high drama back home and you've got the, the latitude to explore big ideas about human destiny and the limitations of human, um, of, of what humans can put up with and, what sides of human nature are likely to win out in the long term and how can, you know, and, and who can rig what incentives in order to try to get their outcome. And I had so much fun with this thing. <laughs> <laughs>
but it just it it emerges from the the creative stew that um that bubbles in the back of my head all the time because i'm just a, a absolute vacuum for anything that catches my interest mm -hmm. i assume that if something catches my interest that there's something there that's worth learning mm. even if it has no intrinsic value the fact of learning it will give me greater access to understanding the world or it may at least give me some cool story ideas so i tend to just follow those rabbit trails when they pop up in front of me yeah that makes sense so the key word I latched onto there was you had was the fun, the F word. Oh yeah. Yeah. Is is that something that's been with you through your writing process? The oh yeah. Time? Yeah. I mean it, it it it's not that writing a long, difficult project is not absolutely miserable at times, but it's fun. It's the kind it's the kind of misery that you get climbing a very large mountain. Yeah, you want to quit every once in a while, you get exhausted. But it's so exhilarating to mm. work through and, and and just play in this universe that you create on the page. And then be, and once you're done, be able to share it with other people and brighten their world or provoke thought from them mm. and in some way change their consciousness. I absolutely love it. Mm. So I, I, I feel called to have like this little tangent here. Go for it. So you mentioned the mountain climbing and the analogy there mm -hmm. and reminded me that that you <laughs> in your story, you can you're welcome to talk about this because I don't want to put words into your mouth. You mentioned mm -hmm. dropping out of high school. Oh yeah. And, and kind of embarking on a set of what you call adventures, where I guess you <laughs> learn about life and the world and and explore. Yep. Right. <laughs> and and among that, perhaps, was mountain climbing. Oh yeah, yeah. I um, had uh, I learned. Uh, I uh, was. Uh, what was it? Uh, had a uh, group of friends who all coalesced around a common mentor when I was high school age, and he was an avid rock climber. So he used to take us out to a park in Berkeley that has acres and acres of pr granite protruding out. And we mm. used to go up there every weekend for two or three summers and just climb the rocks. Mm. Yeah, California's got some great climbing in general and yep. hiking. But do you feel like that your adventures were an important part of becoming a good storyteller. I think so. They, um, if for no other reason than that they have brought me into contact with people who think and feel and value and view the world in ways that would never have occurred to me to even imagine, even with all the reading I did, with my basic upbringing of being a poor suburbanite religious kid in a family of an academic. Um, it's, you know, it was an intellectually rich environment in one sense, but, you know, the suburbs are a very quiet, constrained corner of the human experience. And the kinds of people that I have been privileged to come into contact with and occasionally not so privileged and been lucky to get out of contact with in the years since have populated my mental universe with a panoply of instantiations of the human animal that you just can't get any other way. And it gives you um, a real appreciation for both the potential uh, worlds that you can access through fiction and also the limited nature of your own perspective. And for me, at least, the keen awareness of those two things is it, it's deeply important. And I don't know if I have exactly the words to describe why. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so is, is perhaps a word like connection or understanding or yeah understanding um we meaning yeah, definitely meaning each one of us has got this really limited window of time if we're lucky we last a century maybe with current medical advances some of us will be lucky enough to last a century and a half mm -hmm. 
against a backdrop of human of recorded human history going back 6000 years of the history of the species going back 100,000 years the history of the universe going back 14 odd billion years we've got this little window mm -hmm. and we see so little in such a big world that i can't imagine deliberately narrowing that window further mm. it would be a, a terrible to me it would be a terrible tragic waste of the most fleeting and precious resource any of us have our consciousness and our time mm -hmm. yeah go on it sounds like a ted talk <laughs> in, in waiting here well in the the and and you get you get to see and experience at least by proxy pieces of that by meeting people from outside your bubble and not just meeting them but getting to know them and getting to learn how they think and allowing them to be who they are rather than forcing them to conform to your idea of the way things ought to be mm. um by reading books from people who died a generation, five generations, 30 generations before, books are, we're so accustomed to them. And we're so accustomed even now just to words on the web mm. that the wonder of what written language is rarely occurs to us. Written language is the human race's only successful uh, invention of time travel and telepathy. <laughs> I've got a book. Um, I've got a book here on my uh, on my desk. I just finished reading um, J. Michael Straczynski's autobiography. Is the, oh, uh, I have a copy of that. Oh, from it's Christmas. wonderful. I have not read it yet. What other technology would allow me to live the kind vicariously the kind of life he has lived, starting decades before I was born? And to experience what the world looks like through the eyes of someone who's very, very different than I am in almost every way. Mm. And to come out the other side, not just having gone into his life and gone into his mind, but then to be able to carry a piece of his consciousness with me and have it inform my world. Mm. Every book does that to one extent or another. Mm-hmm. And beyond exploring ideas and having fun and, and you know, obsessively carving away at your stories, is, is that something, like, what are, what are you hoping to convey via this mind reading or time travel with your stories? Well, there's the, there's the, uh, there's the, personal answer and then there's the grand answer and they're both true the personal answer is i love the experience of having transported someone mm -hmm. um you get uh, you get fan mail in you know your book got me through i got one a couple of years ago your book got me through the death of my husband mm -hmm. wow mm -hmm. you know when i wrote the book i was just telling a silly little story that was in my head but something about it gave another person who I never met and had never heard of the, it gave them something they needed to make sense out of a crisis in their life. Mm -hmm. That's really powerful. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that experience is no less powerful when it's just a couple of friends of yours that are reading and laughing at a humorous story that you wrote. Mm. Um, it's a it's a marker that you really do exist and are participating in the world around you. Mm. The the grand reason is that because we each have such a limited window, the the best immortality we can hope for. Um, this is something the Greeks actually formulated, is to, uh, is to have lived in such a fashion that we can at least be worth a song. Mm -hmm. We participate in this cacophonous opera that starts way back at the beginning of recorded history. Um, 
it's the only thing that um, children and art, uh, Sondheim said this in Sunday in the Park with George, children and art are the only two things that we can leave behind that show we were ever here. Mm. And we don't ask to come into the world. Some of us would rather not have done so. And probably all of us at one point or another would rather not have had to deal with the bother. But nonetheless, we're here because of the actions of others. And I feel like we owe a debt to pay what we learn forward so that the next round of unfortunate souls that get yanked into this reality have the ability to use that to make sense of things. And um, at this point in history, you can read a lot more about what I think about this point in history on my blog. I've done a series called uh, Unfolding, uh, or called called uh, Our Unfolding World. Um, we're, I am of the opinion that we're at an inflection point in history, as dramatic as the Black Death or the fall of the Bronze Age. Um, there's these these points in history where a bunch of different forces of culture and environment and technology come together in such a way that the way things used to work mm -hmm. don't anymore. And we have to reinvent everything, which is why there's so much conflict going on. Because when you're reinventing something, you don't know what you can take for granted. And so it's natural both to start fighting to preserve what you used to be sure of and fighting everybody who you think could threaten your potential future yeah it's it, it deep animal instinct to try to preserve ourselves and the one thing that doesn't change is human nature mm. or at least it changes so slowly that all these other things are flashed in the pans next to it mm -hmm. and so at in my view at this time in history participating in that conversation is deeply, deeply important because worst case, you get forgotten, but you had an interesting time. Best case, something you said in one of your books gets picked up by someone else and gets woven into the fabric of history going forward, maybe stimulates them to invent a technology that gets us out of a dead end that we're in now, maybe spurs an idea that... Um, leads to a conversation that creates or that that results in a detente between warring cultural factions you know the the possibilities are astounding as even if any one of them is spectacularly unlikely i don't think that's a particularly good reason to opt out yeah i've been thinking about a lot in the last year more than perhaps I would like to. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I interview storytellers and, mm -hmm. and and write books and stories and songs. And, and you know, I think about my why a lot. And sometimes that leads me to astray and assume making assumptions about the why for others. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think there's a basic human need for people to feel understood and oh, it's yeah. more a more evolved need to want people to understand others. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can see where, you know, you could choose actively to use your stories as a platform for building empathy for others and connection and understanding and peace. Like you mentioned, conciliation in a galactic war. Mm -hmm. Or you could do, you know, the converse, which is, you know, I guess to promote factionalism or a particular um, rooted way of thought. Yeah. And as much as I'm not a fan of that, I wouldn't get rid of those stories and that uh, and that way of doing things for anything mm. because conflict doesn't happen without a reason it sometimes happens for incredibly stupid reasons but conflict is the way that all life forms resolve the incompatibility in the needs between active agents mm -hmm. and so 
even the most divisive, awful, um, tribalist dreck that you can drum up, if as a reader you go to it looking to understand rather than looking to be um, right. necessarily persuaded or mm -hmm. particularly looking to be cheered on because we all do mm -hmm. tend to gravitate towards that which reinforces our own worldview. Mm -hmm. Even the most tribalist stuff can forward the conversation in ways that um, stuff that is overtly conciliatory may never be able to do. Because when we're conciliatory, we do tend to assume that we already understand what the other fellow is on about. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's true. And when it is, it works spectacularly well. Mm -hmm. But when it's not, what we often wind up doing is appearing conciliatory towards people who already agree with us and sounding just as divisive for the folks who are on the other side of whatever line is at stake. Mm -hmm. So uh, understanding that as a keyword mm -hmm. pops out and, and by reading viewpoints, you know, that are alien to us or distressing to us could be a way to promote understanding Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a big believer in that. Uh, assuming that the outcome of the conflict isn't just <laughs> mortal. <laughs> it will well, involve mortality and, and, well, and frankly, often it does. It's yeah. we're we're remarkably privileged to live, unfortunately, at the end of the longest, most peaceful period in world history. Um, no other for people who uh, who are perhaps of the suburbs. No, no, no. For everybody. Yeah. The since World War II, because of because of the need to control the risk of nuclear war between two major superpowers, mm -hmm. there was an unparalleled in history agreement between the nations of the world and between the business sectors of the world to forego certain interests that they might otherwise pursue in the name of advancing general stability. Mm -hmm. And under that umbrella, which is not to say that there haven't been awful brush wars and genocides and whatnot in that time, mm -hmm. um, but under that umbrella, we've had less of that for everybody everywhere with a couple of very localized um, exceptions mm. than is the historic norm where you have ongoing conflict at every level from the familial and the tribal to the city state to the nation state and onward up. Mm. Um, and conflict isn't conflict that's mortal. Isn't just um, warfare. It, you know, war destroys crops. It creates famines. Mm -hmm. It's a whole. You know, there's a whole cascade of um, ripple effects that goes and impoverishes everybody. There's in certain periods of history. The one we've just lived through is one of them, but there have been others. And unjust stability leaves even the folks at the bottom of the stack better off than folks at the bottom of the stack would have been in the circumstances immediately preceding the stable period. Mm. Now, it also doesn't mean that they're always the same folks at the bottom of the stack. And so <laughs> mm -hmm. you do get grievances that arise from folks that have the heritage of being higher up the stack who are now at the bottom and legitimately feel like they've been screwed. Mm. But um, so with that whole, so I'm trying to paint a very nuanced picture, but we live at the end of an incredibly peaceful time. Mm. Um, we've just crossed, in, in my view, we've just crossed over into the next big tumultuous period. And we did it about four or five years ago. Mm. Um, and it, believe it or not, had nothing to do with who's in the White House. That's, it's related, but that's not a causal thing. This was coming anyway. Yeah, I'll, I'll buy that. I. One um, of the words I, I wrote down, <laughs> since we're kind of talking about it without naming it, mm -hmm. you know, tangentially, at least as far as art and commerce goes, uh, is the idea of cancel culture. Oh, don't get me started. 
<laughs> That's exactly what I'm doing. <laughs> okay. Well, all right. My, I'm one of those folks that uh, I, I would, uh, I'll sit with my most mortal enemy mm. who uh, wants me dead around a coffee table and argue about why they want me dead. Mm. Um, what uh, Daryl Davis, uh, amazing hero of a guy. Mm-hmm. Is a, um, I believe he was from South Carolina. He was a black man from South Carolina who made it his business to de-radicalize Klansmen. Mm-hmm. And the way he did it was he went and hung out with them mm-hmm. and made friends with them. People mm-hmm. that nobody would give the time of day because abhorrent ideas, absolutely terrifying uh, rhetoric and history behind the cult, the subculture that they come from. But people wind up in those in those uh, cul-de-sacs for a reason. Mm-hmm. Uh, people reach for extreme, dangerous, and uh, hateful ideas when they themselves are stuck at the bottom in a no-win situation and they don't know what else to do. They look for anything that will allow them to try to give their lives meaning. Mm. And... From that perspective, the people aren't the problem. The ideology itself isn't the primary problem. Mm -hmm. The problem is that humans by nature are much more inclined to look at the folks on the other side of the fence and see them as not quite human and a danger than they are to go over there and buy them a beer. Mm. Why do you think that is? Um, I think it comes from our uh, evolutionary history. When you're when you've got a tribe that's uh, that's desperate to survive, and you've you've got a bunch of tribes running around in the same space, and things are good, you've got peace. But the moment someone feels that their um, that their ability to continue surviving, that their culture or whatnot is under threat that uh, everything they value that gives them their identity is going to be stolen from them by a war or a pogrom or whatever. Mm -hmm. The only way to keep a group together and give it the chance to survive is to externalize all the threat. Mm -hmm. Even if only some of it comes from the outside, some of it comes from the inside, even if it's mostly from the inside. Mm -hmm. Um, from every, uh, was it, uh, who was it? It wasn't Aristotle. It was one of the Greeks, uh, Thucydides. Thucydides pointed out that the, uh, Thucydides argued that the great folly of the poets was that they forget that you cannot love without also hating. Mm. Because to love is to favor one over another. And when it comes to the crisis point, you pick sides. Mm. Um, He argued that this, and the Greeks believed that this meant that war was the other duty of the citizen, the love of the countrymen and war to defend them. Mm. And I think he was expressing something that's built so deep down into our genes that we see it in every social animal species we've ever studied. Mm. And the only really good counter we have to that is to deliberately make the enemy part of the in-group because we understand what it is to have a friend or an ally or an enemy We know how to make friends out of enemies, but we're not, as creatures, we're not well constituted, in my view, to have friends and then, ah, the people over there. We have to. Do you think that's the power then of storytelling in books? The ability to, to make the external into insiders? I do. I think that's one of the great powers of literature. Hmm. Mm. And are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Okay. 
It's like, wait, I haven't, I'm so paranoid. I haven't had the call <laughs> drop yet. I always have I know, the call and drop. I, and I'm way out in the boonies right now. So it's, uh, my, my internet is often iffy. Nice. So you're a good job, internet. <laughs> if you're listening, internet, Google indexing, you know, good job. <laughs> so you have a, you have a production company, you do podcasts, you do audio books. Mm -hmm. um, and so what are you striving for right now? Has it changed over time? Or you, or do you have like a, a, a thoughtful commercial direction to what you're doing? Or are you just following your interests? Um, for a long time, I was trying to build up a good, solid production company in the San Francisco Bay Area and move from corporate video and audio productions into film. Mm -hmm. Film business changed. Mm -hmm. Then the San Francisco Bay Area changed. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was not, uh, California is no longer a good place to have a small company of any kind. Mm -hmm. So I had to pull stakes and uh, strike out for parts unknown. And at that point, I retasked more of my energies towards writing and building the publishing company. Um, I've used the production company to sustain life and limb. Mm -hmm. But my focus is on uh, building the writing career and the publishing company attached to it. And the production company is getting folded into that. Okay. Um, so is that uh, because there's lower overhead and people still value what we're creating? Yes, much lower overhead. And uh, it's also um, it's also more agile. The marketplace mm -hmm in everything. It, if you had talked to me a year ago, I would have said the marketplace in media and storytelling, but now the marketplace in everything is undergoing dramatic upheaval. So mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of agility in uncertain times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, agility and, you know, and sustaining you know, a living or your joy mm -hmm. and purpose and yeah, and, well, and of course, as as creatives, what we produce is uh, fungible for seventy years after we die. So this is also a retirement plan. Mm. <laughs> so what do you what do you think? Where do you think like stories are heading in terms of a a, a product that has value? <sighs> Market wise, it's. Uh, really really tough because now everybody has a publishing platform so anyone mm -hmm. can get into the game mm -hmm. on the other hand in my view because largely of the long piece and the com and the extreme comfort that those of us in most corners of the west have enjoyed creativity has gotten kind of stale in the last 20 years mm. um it's not that people aren't having grand visions or writing on levels that you couldn't have imagined 50 years ago, but the safety has created a sort of uniformity of worldviews and polite uh, and polite ways of engaging with them mm. that gradually has resulted in kind of a samey sameness across the whole spectrum. As things get more tumultuous, what I'm expecting is that in the arts, we're going to see a lot more breathtaking work mm. because humans tend to rise to the challenge and artists are very, very good at transforming a volatile world into something beautiful. Because mm. we're making sense of that? Or? Be yeah, that's right. Because art is one of the ways that humans make sense of things. And currently, culturally, our sense-making apparatus in the West has failed at every level. Mm. So we've got kind of a ground floor to try to dream things up from scratch. Mm. And there's a tremendous amount of freedom in that and a tremendous amount of future value to the culture that we're trying to figure out. Mm. Mm. And there's different types of value. There's like, um, you know, in a scorecard, right? There's, there's how it conveys meaning and what it does for somebody who's on the receiving end of the art. And then there's mm -hmm. um, how easy was it for, to find that person, that consumer, yep. that reader, and what what did they part with to have mm -hmm. that experience? And and 
do you see it as something that that is going to continue to benefit the creator of the property and in what form like are you thinking about books audio yeah no i'm thinking about all of them um i've got I mean, i've got a cartoon series that i'm itching to crowdfund but i'm not in a position right now to make good on the deal so mm. that's holding on until i'm in that position mm. but um the uh uh as long as you hold on to your copyrights and are really good about curating your audience and making them loyal to you instead of loyal to say the platform you're selling on or mm -hmm. the storefront that you're doing business through. Mm -hmm. I think people who manage to thread that needle are going to do very well as mm -hmm. they have been for the last few years. Mm -hmm. People who just throw things out into the ether will sometimes get lucky, but most of the time will get lost. Hmm. And there's different, there's, a, you covered a lot of ground with, with a great deal of diplomacy, by the way. Oh, thank uh, you. <laughs> <laughs> and within that is, is the idea of traditional publishing and independent, right? Self-publishing hmm. and everything between. And like, how are you thinking about that with your own work? Are you, do you, have like a workflow you put it through or you just... oh yeah um so we run our own publishing company as i as i mentioned and i do pick up um so far just audiobook rights from other authors but mm -hmm. um i'm on the prowl for unexploited rights especially for authors who are dying mm -hmm. and whose children don't want to run a publishing company there's uh -huh. the that kind of thing i think traditional publishing will persist for um, for the purposes of estates and mm. for the purposes of public intellectuals or other folks who have something interesting to say that a lot of people might want to hear, but who aren't really inclined to or interested in the business end of it at all. And that's, people, that's a very savvy position, by the way. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah. And, the peop and the people who are so inclined mm. will pay a financial price for that mm -hmm. by not retaining control. But on the other hand, they're, they're licensing out to you. Right. Yeah. But on the other hand, what is, you know, what's the purpose of money in real terms? The purpose of money is that it buys your freedom. Yeah. So um, people who want the freedom from the obligation of running a business, they'll, trade an opportunity cost and they'll pay they pay for it that way but the trade is that their stuff gets out into the world anyway so i think there will always be a business for folks like that mm. but i don't think it's going to be the norm i think it's going to be much more unusual mm. than it was when we were growing up the indie publishing world is now huge and even with what I expect are going to be some very nasty censorship and free speech wars over the next few years, mm -hmm. I don't think that's going to change. Mm -hmm. Those of us who've gotten a taste of freedom and the consumers, the audience who've gotten a taste of freedom, aren't going to want to go back to the walled gardens very often. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And. It's a tricky thing to navigate around walled gardens, given the nature of the internet. Yeah, and and the trickiness I think will always be there because the nature of the internet is that it's always changing. Yeah. So agility is a uh, it's not just a skill to have in your back pocket. It's something you have to practice and update every day, kind of like staying in shape. Yeah. So it's staying up on your copyrights and making sure you're. <laughs> You're properly exploiting those and not yeah. just giving them up. Right. Learn your contracts, learn to read contracts, and anytime you're in doubt, hire a lawyer. Exactly. Well, Dan, for what's next for you? Next for me is um, two things. I've just started a Substack list where I'm going to be um, basically um, – in a series of columns roughing out my not my next nonfiction book, which deals with the deep historical trends that bring us to this moment. Mm. Um, and what I think that means for the next decade or so. Mm. And uh, otherwise um, next for my fiction is I'm that uh, science fiction series. I started back when I was at the courier company. Mm -hmm. 
I've uh, had a go at it three or four times. And every time I get a little further on it and it breaks because I was not yet the writer who was able to write a story that ambitious. Mm. This year's the year that uh, I finally knock it out. It's been, wow. it's been almost 30 years in the writing. I think we've all um, got one of those. That's, yep. that's a big deal. <laughs> almost 30 years in the writing. I actually just came up from redlining the previous volume in the series to do this uh, interview. Wow. So um, my big uh, my big artistic push this year is to do that, and then my big personal push is I've got to build a house. Mm. So mm-hmm. <laughs> from bare earth, it's going to be a lot of work. So a lot of foundational work. So this literally, week. yes. <laughs> I like to soft toss the puns when I can, but so for people <laughs> who want to know more about you, how can they find you? You can find my website at jdsawyer.net, um, and there's blogs going back for years and years. There, there's a the latest blog entry is a link to the new Substack series. Mm. On the sidebar of the blog, you'll find my podcasts. Um, I currently do a daily podcast for writers called The Everyday Novelist, where we talk mm-hmm. about creativity and craft and business and basically anything anyone sends in a question about. Mm -hmm. Um, or a comment telling me that I'm completely wrong. I read all those on the air too. (laughs) And uh, then I also have several fiction podcasts that are full cast audio productions of books and short stories that I've done that you can find in the sidebar there. And the fiction podcasts are going to be going live again for the first time in several years in March. Sweet. So there's a few hundred hours of content to catch up on, and then by March there will be new stuff coming out. <laughs> Perfect. It's the and new Netflix, jdsawyer.net. Right. That's right. And, of course, uh, you can find my books and uh, whatnot at all the fashionable retailers. Great. Well, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode of The Fearless Storyteller. As a reminder, any and all links can be found in the show notes. And if you're enjoying this podcast, will you please consider leaving a review? By doing so, you'll be helping new listeners discover The Fearless Storyteller podcast.